You're listening to Sermon Cast Media from Antioch Community Church in Wichita, Kansas. For more of our sermons, resources, or to support this ministry financially, see our website at antiochwichita.org. We are um, jumping back in. I know it's been a few weeks to our series on um, kingdom narratives, on the parables of Jesus. Uh, we have some, uh, we'll jump into a Christmas series here in the next couple of weeks. And then uh, the beginning of the year, we're actually going to uh, head, uh, like, really deep dive into some, all the things on uh, sexuality and identity. We're going to tackle that. So I'm, I'm sure there'll be just an explosion of optimism and growth in those times and periods, because reading the Bible's definition of those things is always easy to take. Amen. And so we're going to jump into that. We're going to jump in the roles of men and women, uh, just all the things um, that we have generations of young people and established aged, established age people uh, not really having clear, uh, I'm, I'm just shocked at how unclear, especially our younger, gen- younger generations are about what the Bible actually says and why. And so we're going to jump into that together and it'll be fun while we'll some conversations and house church and and so you'd be praying over that, and but um, we're really looking for the Lord to, to do something uh, very cool. And even if there's 12 left of us, we'll just praise God and worship. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, but today we're continuing on the kingdom narratives thing, and, and just to remember, uh, we're going through these parables of Jesus, and parables are just like simple snapshot stories that kind of um, just kind of have are a descriptor, a little shadow, a little look into kingdom truths. And so last time we talked about, does anybody remember what we talked about last time I was up here? I give you a free restored t-shirt, a restored t-shirt, old, our old t-shirts. Well, you can't look it up. Well, I know I didn't say that. It was just assumed. Yes, t-shirt. I'll gladly uh, give you a a T-shirt. Uh, by the way, we have a cool merch site on our on our on our website and then on our our app. Uh, you can go on there and get. Um, but yeah, we talked about uh, the Good Samaritan, how Jesus is um, the Good Samaritan, and we follow in his footsteps. Um, today, uh, we're going to tackle another uh, enormous parable that has multifaceted angles and views and perspectives and. Uh, we're going to tackle it from one angle, uh, but today we're going to be uh, going through the parable of the prodigal son. So which is another uh, really greatly known, uh, we use that term prodigal when we talk about our own kids and rebellion and stuff like that. And so uh, you can open your Bibles to Luke chapter 15, uh, 11 through uh, 24. Uh, I'm, I'm meant to uh, bring up my paper Bible. I'm trying to use that more uh, in my preaching and teaching, uh, but then I forgot it in my office. I think it's holding something up, so I got to use it on my phone. So uh, don't uh, don't judge me for being that guy. Um, so before we get there, before we read the text together, uh, so Jesus is in Luke chapter 15. He's uh, he's just been doing things and teaching and parables, and uh, while some people are being lifted up and the and disciples are are just gleaning and learning. Uh, some people are starting to hate Jesus more and more in the Sanhedrin and the leaders of the day. And but in, and I'll just read this, and I, I think I have it up there, but uh, in, in verses 1 and 2, before we even get to our text, it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. Isn't it funny how they always separate tax collectors and sinners? Why do they do that? Because the tax collectors, it seems kind of funny, but they were on a whole other level of, 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 of wickedness in the eyes of God's people because tax collectors in their day were uh, uh, men who were usually Jewish who actually became representatives of the Roman government and would tax their own people. And so uh, they were hated. And so Jesus is eating, uh, excuse me, sitting with these, uh, these tax collectors and sinners. And they were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. And so that's kind of like the uh, beginning, our opening scene here. And so once again, Jesus is surrounded by broken people. Amen? 
uh, religious people once again are grumbling about Jesus being around broken people. And the problem with it they didn't understand is, A, they were all broken, and B, Jesus came for the sick, not those who are well, but, but there is really nobody that's well. And so Jesus is sitting with busted people again. Jesus is a friend of sinners. Amen? Okay, so I don't know how it's been over the last few weeks, but I'd like this to get a more raucous. Say amen. amen. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Thanks, Brandy. That was good. All of you did really well. Uh, yeah, just help my insecurities and funnel that. So just, um, and so Jesus is a friend of sinners. He came for the broken. And so this whole adage of, you know, I got to clean myself up before I come to Jesus, before I come to church, all those things are just hogwash. They're nonsense. And also, uh, for those of us who are believers and followers in Jesus, we're walking in conviction uh, because we're still continuing in some stupid sin cycles. You have to remember, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost, and he is the repairer and the heart's cry of all things that are broken. Like, Jesus is a friend of sinners. Amen? He's not the friend of elitist people who are in a religious country club. He's just a friend to broken people. Now, we can hash that out of what that means. Uh, does that mean he didn't call people to the truth? No, he was such a good friend that he called people to the absolute truth and loved them in his delivery and in the journey. Amen? And so Jesus is sitting with these folks, and then he jumps into three parables uh, right in a row, and they're all kind of similar. And the first one is the parable of the lost sheep. So everybody knows the parable of the lost sheep, where Jesus leaves the what? He leaves the 99 to chase after the one, right? And there's great rejoicing when he finds his lost uh, sheep. Uh, and then the next one is the parable of the lost coin, correct? So this woman loses one of her coins, one out of 10, seeks for it diligently, tears up the house, um, and then celebrates greatly when it's found. So you have these two parables that talk about something that was lost, and then it was sought after, and then it was found. And then we have, we jump into the parable of the prodigal son, and it's the same but different. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. So if we look in Luke chapter 15, 11 through 24, let's read it together. It'll be up on the screen, but you can read it along in your Bibles and devices. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began uh, to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants." And he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, everybody say a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring, uh, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf, and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and he's found, and they begin to celebrate. So as we jump into this uh, familiar uh, story, um, we're just going to take it piece by piece, and cut it up, and kind of just see what the Lord has for us in it. So as we break it down and we look at verses 11 through 12, just to read it again, just for a focus sake. And he said, there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. So there's actually more than one prodigal son in the story. There's two prodigal sons in the story. The other one just uh, prodigals prodigals differently. And we'll talk about that at another time. The older brother, the other brother who stays, uh, has uh, uh, different issues, but they still focus on 
a honestly a lack of reverence uh, for the Father. But today we're going to talk about this this typical uh, this story of this uh, young prodigal who busts out and leaves, and he he wants his inheritance now. Now in those days it was not such a foreign idea that before a father died he could pass off inheritance to his his um, his uh, the people that his kids. Uh, whoever he's granting to in the inheritance, or he could pass it off uh, after he dies. And so uh, in this sense, in this instance, it is not overly weird. It was pretty rare, but it was not obscene for a father to give his son uh, his inheritance. And so what does the father do? The father does it. The father does it. We don't seem to have any argument. Uh, Jesus doesn't talk about any long conversation. Uh, the Lord uh, just seems to point to the fact that the father just uh, let him do it. And so, and as we look further into the story and the wisdom of the father, and I really want to see things from not only the perspective of the son, but also the perspective of the father, because it's pretty impressive. Um, but we, we have to think that the father knows his son is doing something foolish. We have to know. Like he knows his son, like he just, I, I just, and maybe we're eisegeting here, but there's something weird about why, you know, just gives it over to his son. And we'll see this more and more as the story goes. But um, this is really a part of the father heart of God. He just uh, released him. Uh, this whole free will thing comes up a lot in the middle of this. And he releases him, gives him his inheritance, and we'll just see what the son does. And so in Luke 15, 13, it says, Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had, and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. I remember when Cale first moved out of our house, we moved into Waco, and his act of rebellion was he went and bought a bunch of Pokemon cards because his mama wouldn't let him have Pokemon cards when he was younger. So that was was Cale's uh, claim to rebellion. By the way, if there's something for your kid to be rebellious about, I guess that's okay. Amen? And, uh, and he spent some money on other dumb things and LARPing, whatever he was doing. But anyway, uh, but <laughs> I, I didn't get it. I just didn't say much. Okay. Uh, uh, but uh, immediately the son, just a couple days later, lives to li- leaves to live a life independent of his father. So, um, uh, and he was reckless and he's probably foolish and extravagant. He squandered uh, all of his stuff. And uh, we can imagine it was probably a blast for a minute, Right. He's got nothing but stuff, and he's got money. He's out from the covering of his father. He's out from discipline. Woo! I remember when I was a teenager, and I had moved out of my uh, uh, family, uh, very broken family home for the last time, uh, got on welfare, and uh, yeah, I'm pretty proud of that, yep, and uh, in Canada, and, uh, and so at first, I was like, whoa, I've got a whole $625 a month which my rent was like 450. Go figure that out. Yeah. And I got all this money and I got all time. I got nobody telling me what to do. I could finally parent myself. And I was like, woohoo! And so for the first little while, I was jamming. We were having parties and all the things were happening. I could do whatever I want, whenever I wanted, go to school late, not go to school. I could do all the things. And then, um, <laughs> uh, as you can imagine, uh, that, that quickly wore off when I began to discover that I was responsible for everything. Money wasn't endless, and I actually had to take care of myself and vouch for myself. Uh, uh, that ended very quickly, right? And then you start becoming, you know, the, your friends start trash talking you because you start becoming the old man. What are you, dad, or something? Like, just get your feet off my coffee table. Stole that from the lady down the street. Just kidding. Um, uh, but the son, uh, he just, he learns real quick, and he squanders all of it. He, the, the, the scripture's clear. Like, he gets rid of all of his inheritance. It's all gone. And then in Luke 15, 14 through 16, it says that when he had spent everything, uh, isn't this interesting, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him squat. No one gave him anything. I call this a holy moment where the stuff hits the fan. And so um, he's completely broke. And then wouldn't you know it, as he's completely broke, a famine comes. 
And so as we know, as we look at the big picture of things, do you think it was a coincidence the famine happened? I don't know. I don't know if the, I don't know if the Lord sent famine and the rescue and the story of the heart of what's going on, but I do know that the famine just happens, amen, and, uh, and, he, uh, and he's in this place. And so here's the problem. Uh, more important than wasting away his inheritance, uh, he is now without something far more valuable, and that is his covering. He has lost the covering of his father's house. Regardless of squandering all the money away, um, money away, there's a bigger problem. And so storms and famine come, amen? Where you endure them makes an enormous difference. This quote, uh, hard seasons are always difficult, but there is peace in the storm when you're under the covering of your father's house. That's the thing about being a believer and a follower of Jesus. It's not about storms coming or not. It's about enduring them in a way that has hope and peace. And so you can be in the middle of a world on fire, people perishing, money gone, but there's something about standing in the middle of the house that God built in the presence of the Father that gives you security because you know the foundation isn't going anywhere you know the roof isn't going anywhere. And although you might be suffering immensely, you don't have to suffer hopelessly because the God of heaven is with you and you're covering. That's part of what it is to be a believer, is to be under the covering of the Father, right? This is why when we're in rebellion, no matter if we're a follower of Jesus or you have not yet surrendered your life to Jesus, what you're doing is you are placing yourself outside the covering and the covenant and the promises of God to walk with you and help you in times of trouble. Trouble always comes. Everybody say always. But where we do it matters. And when we're in rebellion, when we're running from the Lord, we miss out on the covering. Matter of fact, God will use the uncovering over your head to draw you back home. Why do bad things happen to good people? We know the answer to that. There is no good people. But sometimes bad things happen to rescue and reclaim the hearts of sons and daughters who have run away. And it's worth it. Amen to that, brother. Um, thank you, Lord. Uh, the story goes on. And he, in that same text, he finds, uh, he sells himself into work. Uh, he's feeding pigs in which... Uh, he doesn't say uh, that they, this is a Jewish kid, but we presume that Jesus is talking about a Jewish family. It's their context and their world. So uh, he's, he goes from being a son living in the covering of the father in a wealthy, seemingly wealthy family to now he's selling himself into slavery, essentially, working as a servant for somebody else. And not only that, but what he is doing is completely unacceptable and offensive to the Jew Jewish culture. Like, they wanted nothing to do with pigs, right? Like, literally, if you look in Leviticus 11, 7, it says, And the pig, because it parts the hoof and is cloven-footed but does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. They were not allowed to have bacon. Let's just praise God for the new covenant. Amen? Mm -hmm. Fry, fry, sizzle, sizzle. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but it gets so bad, even where he is, he's, listen, he's, he's longing for the food that pigs ate. How do you go from so high a heights under the covering of the Father, the provision of the Father, the love of the Father, to now squandering in filth and starving for the feed of animals that are disgusting to you. And not to get too ahead of myself, but honestly, that is literally the picture of sin. That's what happens when we walk in unrepented, undealt with, unbelieving prior to baptism and following Jesus. That's what it is when we walk in sin. It is more than just doing something bad that annoys God. That's not it. What it does is our sin separates us from God. We're all guilty of it. And when we walk in that kind of sin, either as unrepented believers or as non-believers, what we are doing is we are literally basking in the swine, 
in the slop, in the garbage when, and it's a choice. We don't have to eat there. But to be honest, some of us have gotten used to pig slop and comfortable in pig slop. When we are supposed to be under the covering of the king, our father, and not eating uh, uh, pig pods, is that what they call it? Pods? I don't even know what that looks like. It's a big deal. And so, um, and then this starts to happen. You could see the wheels start to turn in his head. So would you all agree he's at the bottom of the barrel? By the way, can I say this? Um, I, I know I've said it before, but one of the holiest places in the existence of man sometimes is the bottom of the barrel. Sometimes the most holy, rejuvenating, revival birthing place on earth is the bottom of the barrel. Because the bottom of the barrel signifies a place where you have brought all the destruction on yourself, trying to do things your way and your pride and your way, and you have to make a decision in that moment. Now, you could keep digging and keep trying to go beyond the barrel. I know people that live in the barrel. Or you can say, you could just throw out your hands and say, Lord, uh, I, I need you to come and take over. But this is why the church is a place for the broken people. We're not, uh, this is why church doesn't work. We're trying to entertain and make people feel good about themselves. That is not the existence of the real church. The real church is a house full of busted people who remember what it tastes like or feels like or smells like to be on the bottom of the barrel, and they are redeemed by Jesus, and they're out there pulling other people out of the barrels themselves. That's what the church is. The redeemed, those who have been rescued from the bottom of the barrel, that's our new church name. Formal, former bottle dwellers, Community Church Incorporated. Amen. And so, but we see this, and he it says, listen, listen to the words. Verse 17 says, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to the father, my father, and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. This is the pivotal moment in the life of this son. And he shows us some powerful steps in repentance that we need to know. And so what we do in the middle of the slop in your life, what we do in the middle of the self-ordained, self-brought on all the things of sin and brokenness, whether it's in our relationships, it's sexually, it's, it's, it's gluttony, it's all the things. What we do in the middle of that, how we respond in the middle of the junk, uh, as we see in the witness of this young man, will change everything. So that means we have to stop complaining about being in the middle of a self-inflicted pit and actually start to have our mind and our hearts changed for something else. Amen? I don't understand why, but some of my biggest pity parties have been over uh, feeling sorry for myself about pits I put myself in. Right? Blaming everybody else. Everybody else's fault. They did this, they did that, da, 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 da. and in the end, the Lord calls me to something deeper. And this is a pivotal moment. I have this, um, this thing. Well, first, uh, our big, the thing, number one, that he that he brings us to is he comes to himself. He begins to think clearly. Literally, the text says, he came to himself. He had an awakening of the mind. He just got clear for a minute. And he saw through all the pride, all the transgression, all the brokenness, all the hunger, and he came to himself. He literally had an awakening in his mind, which is necessary. He begins to think clearly. John Piper has this, this quote, and it just uh, I just love it. I want to share it with you. When you are alienated from God, you are always alienated from yourself. You can't know yourself or relate properly to yourself if you are running from the one who made yourself for himself. You were made by God in the image of God for God. These are the three main things about your identity as a human being. You are made by God, like God, and for God. Therefore, conversion is coming to yourself as well as coming to God. It is discovering where you came from and who you are and why you exist. Running from God is always running from ourselves. Repentance is waking up to this truth.
Do you understand what that's saying? Like you were created by a father who has very specific purposes and plans and, and heart for your life. And so when, when we rebel and we run from God, whether as a believer or not as a believer, what we are doing is actually running away from what our true identity is. Your real, who am I? I, I know especially young adults and stuff like, I gotta find myself, man. You can find yourself flat in the middle of the scriptures. You don't need to find yourself. All you need to do is realize who you are in Christ Jesus. Now there's, there's truth to like, oh, what am I supposed to do? Those are all Jesus questions though. Those aren't go sow my wild oats for a couple years, act like a fool and find who I'm saying. You know what you're going to find? You're going to find a sinner far from God. And the answer to that is coming back to center. In this pivotal moment, this young man, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, his mind flips and he's starting to see clearly and realize his identity problem. And so the second thing he teaches us, so one, he comes to himself. The second thing he teaches us, he remembers the goodness and abundance of the Father's house. He starts thinking, and you could see him starting to mull this over, and he's like, whoa, even even the servants have more than enough. The servants are good. And so I know what I'll do. I'll just be a servant. I'll go groveling. Uh, He's not focused on what he can bring. He's not focused on being paid for good work. He's like, I will grovel, and it's not about what he can offer. It's about the abundance of the Father's house. He starts to remember, which is a good thing for us, to remember in the middle of our squander, the middle of our rebellion, the middle of our prodigal seasons, how good the goodness of God was, how good the Lord has been to us, what it was like to actually wake up without horrific conviction and the walk in peace and the walk in hope and have the power of the Holy Spirit. One of the most Christian things you can do as a disciple of Jesus is remember. Remember the good things of God. Remember the power of God. Remember the hope and covering of God. Um, Piper has a, another quote. I, Piper just has really good stuff on this. But Repentance is believing that God is so great and so good that the smallest enjoyments of his house are better than 10,000 worlds without him. The son is like, man, the scraps of the food of the servants in my father's house are better. Remember back in the day, in the 90s, we used to sing better as one day in your courts, right? Literally, moments with the Father can produce more hope and glory and peace than lifetimes living in the darkness. And we get full access to it. And that's the whole thing about this story as I go on. Not only do I go, hey, prodigal, you're dumb. Go over to the Father's house. That's me. How many times have we been the prodigals? And it's so ridiculous because I am building a life in mud when I have a house built on the rock, right? That's what I'm doing. That's what my sin is, my sin struggle. What it is is alienating me from the Lord and my inheritance and walking with the God of heaven. The third thing he does after coming to a realization and starting to think about the Father's out is he humbles himself. Listen, he, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's just going back to the text. Um, this is the fulcrum point of the story, I like to call it. Like the Lord allowed him to go through self-inflicted junk to realize that self-inflicted junk are not enough to carry him and to lead him into a prosperous life. He comes low. Everybody say low. Low, low, low. I don't, I don't know stuff. Okay. By the way, this low thing, some people think, well, that doesn't <laughs> That doesn't sound very nice. God just wants us to be low, uh, to be low. Uh, Listen, humility and meekness and lowness are the only posture for followers of Jesus. Because when we, and people are like, well, that sounds kind of weak. Aren't we strong in the Lord? Listen to what I said. We are strong in the Lord. In my own two feet, in my own strength, in my own heart, in my own mind, I'm wicked to myself. And the lower we get, the stronger we get. Because the lower we get, the less we come out and the more he is is glorified and the power of God comes through our lives. Get over yourself. Get onto the power and the peace in the kingdom of God. That's how we become strong. Not by how I vote or what I do or my church attendance, none of that. It's by how I humble and low myself before the God of heaven. And that starts to happen. And we see this all throughout the scriptures one of my favorite verses in all the scriptures in, in the, is in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Listen, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We've said that for years. The translation of this means spiritually bankrupt. 
Blessed are people who are spiritually bankrupt. Why? Because spirit, people who are spiritually bankrupt give up and surrender to the one who does. We got fooled into thinking a long time ago that strength was something other than that. James 4, 6 says, He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Uh, what's the best way to win in any situation or fight you're in with? And Jen gets mad, and we have like marital spats. It doesn't happen very often. Once every few years. But I'm so humble and get so low, she really has nothing to complain about. So she just has to repent and come to the Lord, and the fight's over. Amen? I think I need to apologize for that. I repent for what I just said there, Lord. In Austria, it was great. We only got into one fight. I only made Jen cry one time. That's like victory uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in the new age. <laughs> Sorry about that, babe. Uh, I did apologize right away, right? Give me credit for that. Okay, good. Um, uh, humility is the, the way that we get out of the holes we're in. Um, even if you're, guess what? Even if you're right, humility uh, is the path through. And the fourth thing he does is he, <laughs> not only does he come to himself, uh, he remembers the things of the Father's house. He humbles himself. And here's one thing that actually is so pivotally important is that he, he heads back to the Father's house. He doesn't spend years contemplating revival. He doesn't spend years thinking about what could be. He just gets up and he goes. Low, humble, broken, hungry. Um, and you can imagine, as you could see as we read the text, he's having a conversation with himself. <laughs> literally, as we, we, just, we just look through that, he's like, literally, okay, I'll say this to the... Have you ever done that? You ever been in so much trouble and you're on the way home and you know you're going to run into dad or mom and you're like having this conversation? Okay, here's what I'm going to say. I didn't mean to do that. I knew I was supposed to be home, but then an alien came and then I got abducted and all these things. And so you've got your story perfectly worked out, right? <laughs> you've got it. You bring the delivery and, and, and guess what? Uh, literally what you say doesn't really matter at all. What? Uh, you're going to get whooped. Amen? At least in a good, solid, biblical household. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I'm not sorry. Uh, he, 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 uh, he's just low, and he's talking to himself. Um, here's the thing, is that uh, he could have just stayed there. <laughs> uh, I want you to listen to this. He could have just stayed there and done several things. He could have tried to ride it out and change his perspective on where he was. I call it the um, doctrine of polishing turds. <laughs> it's oh, a head shake over there. Uh, it, literally, uh, some of us, instead of surrendering and going to the Father, we will take the dung hole we're living in and we'll just try to renew our perspective and paint the walls and make it acceptable. Right? But guess what? There's no father there. There's no food for your soul there. You just have a painted turd. It sounds, but I want it to stick in your brain. Like, I know some of you have been to the the, uh, the mindful Home Depot and picked up supplies to go and to refinish your turd space. Am I wrong? I mean, this is what it is. Like you try, like you're trying to get tenacity and you're trying to build up, you know, you're trying to get fervor and just try to stick things out and be resilient. Uh, and then in the end, what are you doing? You literally have a pretty painted pile of dung. And that sounds, sounds funny, but that's what we do. Instead of running to the Father, going back home low, we try to make it and be resilient. I know people that have been stuck in there, and I've probably done it 10 or 20 years because they're angry or they're ashamed or all the things, and they just won't leave it and go back to the arms of Jesus. Doesn't matter if you go to church. Doesn't matter all this. I'm talking about literally running to the arms of the Father with lowly hearts, humble hearts, confession, and just... I need you. <laughs> Don't post online. I said that anywhere. I want you to hear this. This quote just kind of just kind of came to my heart. Like, 
Kingdom resilience is standing strong and hanging on through storms in the places you were meant to be. Foolishness is trying to stand strong and hang on in the places you were never meant to be. I know a lot of really resilient people. I know some drug addicts. They're some of the most resilient people I know. Most creative, I know. I know some people that walk around harboring unforgiveness and hate for somebody that hurt them, uh, and they are resilient, but they are not free. I think sometimes we need to gauge our resilience. <laughs> like we've been through it, like Jen and I, we've been through a lot of stuff over the years. Sometimes I have to go and take stock and go, <laughs> uh, well, how much of that was self-inflicted? <laughs> and, you know, how much did I learn from? Like going through junk happens. We've known that, okay? What did you learn from it? What did God do in the middle of it? Or were you just being resilient in your flesh and in your pride because you didn't want to submit to anybody because you're hurt, because you're mad, or just because you're prideful? <laughs> but here's the cool thing. Um, <laughs> the Lord used this famine to break the heart of the son, to send him home. And the Lord has given you and allowed you to go through storms in your life to break your heart, to send you back home. Because he's a jerk? No, because he's a jealous God. He wants to be close to you. And what he has is so much better for you. I know a lot of people get mad about going through hard season. How can God do this to me? Um, and sometimes uh, I get it. I've, I've battled with those questions. Sometimes that was actually a rescue unit coming to save you from your own self-inflicted death. That's why uh, I always encourage us to look at our suffering in a different lens. We lost a baby. It's how we came to faith. There's an affair in our marriage years ago. It's what changed our hearts for the kingdom of God. Things we've been through over the last couple of years have broken my heart with some people in my lives, and they've made me realize I, 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 can, I only have Jesus to trust, and only Jesus uh, is going to change the situation. I can't do it. i got to take my hands off. I didn't learn that without famine. I didn't learn that without pig slop. I didn't learn that without being rescued from my rebellion. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. But this kid, uh, I call him a kid, <laughs> he, he passes all that. And so it says in Luke 15, 20 through 24, he says, listen, and he arose and came to his father. while he was still a long way off. The father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to the father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it, put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they begin to celebrate. Here he is on this journey home thinking about this conversation with his father, probably extremely nervous because he's got to confess that he lost all of his inheritance. He's got to confess that he was uh, eating amongst animals and pig slop that were detested by their culture. And he, he's probably had some run-ins with loose women and all the things. Like he's probably thinking about all the things that are going on in his head. But something in the middle of that thought get, interrupts him. What interrupts him? The father's eyes were on the road. father was looking for him. The father daily, can you ever imagine the dad's perspective? Like the father every day working, doing his thing. 
And we'll talk about, you know, why didn't he run after him? He he let him go, but his eyes were continually on the road. And while he was a long way off, the position of the son just coming back home was enough for the father to run to him and greet him with a kiss and a hug. The father's eyes were on the road. By the way, a middle-aged man of wealth did not run. That was not civilized, which is what I tend to use for my excuse. I know Matt, Matt's not here, but the reason I don't run is because it's uncivilized, or I would. But the father doesn't care, and he just runs. In a minute, this son gets completely consumed by the father's hugs and kisses. No rebuke, no sarcasm, no cold shoulder just the love of a father, and he hadn't even said anything yet. Some of us as fathers, we, we have the, uh, we have the uh, indwelling of the spirit of uh, 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 sarcastic uh, rebuke for our children. Oh, that didn't work out well for you, huh? Oh, you got in some pig slob. Dang, big surprise. Uh, you, don't, you, don't, you don't hear any of that from this father. The joy of the reuniting with his son overpowers all of what he's done. And so then the kid starts in with his confession. I have sinned against you and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And then then the scripture says, but it's almost like he was cut off like mid-sentence, mid-spiel. And he's like, father, I'm not worthy. I just want to be your servant. I'm not worthy to be called your son. And the father's like, hey, Now, get him the best robe, get him a ring, get him shoes, go kill the fatted calf. Like he interrupts his son's spiel with this glorious thing. And by the way, none of those things were minimal provisions. Those were all things you only gave to sons. You didn't put your cloaks and stuff and robes on a servant. You didn't put your rings on a servant. You didn't give them shoes. You definitely didn't kill a fatted calf and have a celebration for your servant. You only did that for a son. What happened in the midst of this kid's spiel about how wrong he was is that the father restores him and lavishes sonship on him in a moment. Y'all, if if we don't understand that this is what happens when sons and daughters turn back to the Lord, then you're missing it. Every one of these parables about the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son, they play out in different ways. All of them end with one thing, celebrating. Joy in heaven. The angels are worshiping and praising and celebrating because he loves that son. Quote, the father overwhelmingly loves his son back home. And it has nothing to do with his son's words or pleading. Listen, it has everything to do with his proximity and posture to his father. Wasn't a word he could say, but the son came back low and he came back close. And that was enough. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Your words don't really matter in the end. Your pleading and reasonings why you did what you did doesn't matter. Proximity and position to the Lord makes the change of everything. Amen? We go in low, but we get lifted up as sons and daughters. Repentance isn't this agonizing thing of feeling bad. Repentance is running up the road to the Father who welcomes us. He longs to be with you. That's why Jesus, literal words of Jesus telling this story. This is what happens in the spiritual, and he's telling it in a snapshot of what happens in the stories that the father longs to be with his son, longs to be with him. And there's great celebration in him coming home. Restoration into the family was now complete. That that end text in verse 24, for my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Can you remember one of those parties are like? Yo, bro, I'll take some of that fatted calf. Uh, young brother, you didn't bring back any bacon, did you? Oh, never mind, never mind. Uh, sorry. <laughs> they celebrate. <laughs> um, and the scriptures connect 
those celebrations on earth with a greater grandeur and picture of the celebration that happens in the spiritual place and in the heavens. Over you, one of you, lowly, broken man or woman, highly celebrated and redeemed sons and daughters. Do you see the tragedy that happens when we take our eyes off the truth of what God has done in his heart for us? What if we could wake up every day knowing we have a father that runs to us when we come low, lavishes us with the things of the kingdom and not pathetic pieces of trash, barely making it through? Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say thank you, God. Just want to... Just a few application points as we've been going through this, looking upward, looking inward, uh, respond forward. Like, uh, what does this parable teach us about the Lord other than what everything we've just said? Uh, number one, the Lord deeply loves us and he's a good father. Gosh, he's such a good father. Man, he so deeply loves you. And you're like, well, I don't feel loved. Okay, well, I get it. But your feelings are can be wicked and satanic. Just look to the cross and you are loved. I don't understand sometimes when I and some people I love very dearly continue to complain and God's never done anything for me and I've tried to do this and all those things. It's just satanic garbage. What do you mean? He died for you to be free. He gives you gifts. He gives you the spirit. He gives you eternity. What are you talking about? Some temporal things that happen in your life that don't go well? Those can be gifts of God not opportunities for me to whine about why God didn't step in. God can't not step in. He's in the midst of it. Amen? So I got my grandson over there, and I want to yell too much, but he needs to get used to it. <laughs> uh, here's another thing we learn about the Lord in the middle of this, and I want you to hear this. He loves us enough to let us go. Oh, gosh, listen he loves us enough to let us go. Why didn't the father run after him and stop him? What, look, we see in the, in the parable of the sheep and the coin that somebody actually went and looked, and in this parable of the son, he didn't do that. Why? Listen, sheep get lost and can't find their way back even when they want to come back. They have to be found. This is a salvific picture. Number two, a coin doesn't know it's lost. A coin is a coin, but it's searched out because it's treasure to the owner. Praise God. Well, listen, to truly... To truly recover a son, you've got to let them go so they can return on their own and want to be there. You have to release sons and daughters to want to be there. That's why this free will thing is such a big deal. But the Lord loves us enough to let us go. And there's a lot of scripture in the New Testament talking about people who are in uh, unrepented sin. We're supposed to hand them over, pray them over to the hands of the enemy, literally, so hopefully, that there's a chance in the middle of that brokenness that they would respond and come back to the Father. Sometimes the only roadway back for some of us that are so stubborn are literally with the breath of demons breathing down our necks. And the father knows that. Well, how could the father let him go? Think about if the father would have ran after him and brought him back. Would he have really have had his son? No, he wouldn't have had his son. He'd have somebody living there serving him who always thought about being somewhere else and wasn't honoring and loving and coming underneath the covering of his father. That's you and me. Why did I go through this hellacious time? Why didn't God save me? Because God, not all the time, but I'm sure that part of the story is God wanted you to come back and want to be there on your own. I don't want my kids to love me because my title is dad. I want my kids to love me because I'm their father. That's why so many of us have a disconnect issue with our dads. <laughs> and his eyes are on the road. Do not think for a minute that when you come back to the house of the father, there's disappointment and and, and angst waiting. He's his literate. Can you imagine all of us at one point salvifically 
when we surrendered our lives to Jesus for the first time at War Rockham, we were met by the God of heaven running to us to embrace us, to put us on and clothe us in the heavenly things. Same thing happens, brothers and sisters, when we repent from seasons of sin and being rebellious. The Lord welcomes you back. Uh, so that's what it says about the Lord. Next part is look inward. What does it reveal about us? <laughs> uh, these are just, uh, yeah. Uh, number one, uh, we're just dearly loved sons and daughters of the Lord. The question is, is that enough? It's like you're a dearly loved son and daughter of the King of Heaven. It's not a trumpet, is it? We're not going. We're... I don't care about all them, Lord. Just take me. No, I'm just kidding. No. Take us all, Lord. Um, man, you're, you're not just servants. You're not just screw-ups in the eyes of Christ. You are, a, you are the redemption target of God. You're loved. You're so deeply, deeply loved. Um, and the next one in that is, no matter what we've done, we can go back home if we would humble ourselves. Uh, no matter what we've done, we don't get downgraded to servants when you're already a son. You hear me? We don't get downgraded to servants when you're already a son. It doesn't happen that way. I make jokes sometimes, like if I get to heaven, I'm okay with being in the janitor's closet, right? I mean, I literally think that way. Like, I just want to be there. Put me in the basement of the up top, not the lower basement, right? Put me underneath the floor, God. I don't care. I just want to be there. But in the end, that's foolishness because the Father is waiting for me, right? And when I repent, um, no matter what I've done, no matter what, y'all, I have seen uh, worry warts get redeemed in this, and I have seen sexual abusers get redeemed. Whether you like it or not, men and women who sin, no matter what the sin is, there is redemption in Christ Jesus. Nothing you've done will make the Father run away from you. I'm going to say this. Uh, another thing for us in this is this is a roadmap on how we treat prodigals in our own lives. Listen, whether it's spiritual sons and daughters or it's physical sons and daughters, sometimes we have to let them go. To get them back. We have to let him go. Um, I wrote this down like, enabling and chasing after prodigals can lead to a catastrophic lack of repentance and submission to the Father. Sometimes you just can't love and hug it out of them. Sometimes they have to go and sit in the filth of their rebellion. We have to let go. And like a prodigal father, you sit every day staring down the road, staring at the gate, screaming in your heart, please come home. <laughs> but you can't force them to come back. You will never have them back until they come back low and broken. but we keep our eyes on the road. Y'all, I never, this is, over the last couple of years, this hit home for me so much more than I ever thought. I never thought I would have to experience different levels of this. And it has been one of the hardest things in my life to leave things over to the Lord and trust and look for the things of true repentance of God. But when they come home, we don't go with our sarcasm. And we don't go with our angst. We go with rings and robes. And we welcome spiritual or physical sons and daughters home. And uh, I've said this a lot. Uh, and you, 
just use wisdom and what it looks like. Because if there's a spiritual son or daughter, physical son or daughter, who wants to meet you at the gate and give a list of terms about how they will surrender their things, if this, this, and the other works, that's not, they're not ready yet. They're not ready yet. But please come home. And last but not least, just how do we respond in obedience? A million things. Number one, if you've never become and surrendered your life as a son or a daughter to the living God, what are you doing? The God of heaven, there's all the things you've done. He's seen every single thing you've done. And the blood of Jesus washes it. He just wants you to come. That's what it is when we surrender our lives to Jesus. We are saying, I can't do this anymore. God, I need you. I believe. God, help my unbelief. God, fill the void of my life. Come and you are Lord of my life. If you have not done that, you need to surrender. Secondly, if you're a son and daughter, but you've been living like a prodigal, come home. Aren't you tired of the painted slop? You think it's better to be stuck and self-justifying in the middle of that porn addiction, inappropriate relationship, hallways built of anxiety and worry than it is in the, the house of the Lord? You've got to make a literal physical step to come low and to remember that I can't do this and come back up the road to the heart of Jesus. You know what? Well, it's embarrassing if I do that. Well, people I won't think, that is satanic. Let me yell quietly. Knock that off. Uh, <laughs> the last two things. Uh, thank God for the broken road. I'm, gonna, I'm two inches short of a country song. Uh, thank God for the broken road that led us back home. Uh, uh, <laughs> I am so sorry for the things that you've been through, but man, you've got to see. Maybe those are the very things that God used, as broken as they were, to champion you, to, to, to seek after doorways and build roads back home for you. And last but not least, live your life like a son and daughter of the king. If you're in the house, I don't care how you feel, how you identify as a son or daughter, you're a son and daughter. That is reason enough to carry you in hope and joy and peace the rest of your life. That's reason enough for you to lay down your, your stuff and your things and uh, uh, sickness and sin. It's enough. Matter of fact, if the things that keep coming out of your mouth are, I'm not this, I'm not that, God never does this, why don't you just wholly shut up for a minute? I'm dead serious. Stop blaspheming the goodness and the works of God with your voice because your emotions won't catch up with what the truth of God says. No, you're not good enough. No, God doesn't always work the way you want him to but he works exactly like he wants to, and you are exactly who he says you are. You need to catch up with him. Well, that was jerky. We're going to go into a time of worship. and got this short this intro video into worship. and um, I would love more than anything this morning for there to be I just, this is a weird prayer, but Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would illuminate roads this morning. I'm just praying, like literally, wherever you sit, wherever you are right now, that a road comes in the Spirit and just this road that you don't know where it's going, but you need to know it leads back to the heart of the Father. Like you've never surrendered your life and you're going to walk in the road the first time. I'm serious. Hell is a real place, but so is heaven in the promises of God. And it's a free gift for those who would bow their knee to the Lord. And if you're a son and daughter who's returned, like you went back to the house of slop and you're in the middle of that season, burn it down and come home. Repentance and lowliness and confess to somebody else in the room, come forward and give prayer. If anything else resonated with your heart today, man, just would you please respond the person that is beckoning your heart right now is that father with his eyes on the road longing for you to come back, 
even if it's just situational. 